Today, we're going to continue on in our study of Romans. So we just took a little break last week to celebrate what God's been doing in the life of our church. And uh, we're back into Romans this week. And our passage for this week touches on and addresses a problem that I have, right? So being the preacher guy, reading the study, uh, listening to what God has to say all week long, God's been talking to me about a problem that I have through the scripture. So you might not have my same problem, but this is one that God's worked in my heart to help me see and to connect with. My problem, if I was gonna boil it down, is a bit of a struggle, a fight to identify, to nail down what makes God happy, right? How do I please God? I'm weird. You might not have that problem. Uh, You might not ever struggle with that, but I'm aware that my Heavenly Father, as I read the Scripture, demonstrates over and over He's got a really high level of expectation for me. It's pretty hard for me to walk away from the Bible and think, you know what, God's just sort of wishy-washy on whether or not I follow Him or not. Seems pretty adamant. You know, He calls Himself a jealous God, and then He pursues us, and then He puts all of these opportunities in front of us and he gives us commands and teachings and words and truths and you're like that seems like somebody that wants a lot for us and I have a hard time with that because I don't want to disappoint God but I don't always know how to live up to that standard okay now time out before you send me emails right now I can see you texting Uh, I am aware that I cannot it is impossible for me to pay God back for the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. I know that, right? I am 100% certain that what I have received from God is a true gift. I don't pay him back, I haven't earned it, and I never can. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is when you love someone, you want to meet their standards, right? When you love someone in your life, you want to do what's expected of you with them. You want to satisfy them. You want to please them. If you're not doing that in your relationships, that's the problem, right? If you're like, I don't understand my marriage is not working. Well, try pleasing your partner every now and then. It'll help, okay? It's just a a freebie, side tip on relationships. (laughs) So that's the struggle, And you have this desire to want to not disappoint God. I want to please God. I want to meet his expectations. But I don't always, I can't clearly see how to do that. Right? Maybe it's just me. Maybe all of you have this all nailed down and you've got it perfectly. Or perhaps you've never thought about it before. And now I've put this idea in your head. I apologize. Um, But what we're going to be studying today, this passage, we're going to be in Romans chapter 13. Okay? What we're going to be studying in Romans 13 is going to open up this question, at least it has for me, and it helps us see very clearly what does it take? What does it look like to live a life that pleases the Lord? Right? That seems important. That seems like people who believe that our Heavenly Father loves us and has come into our lives and our world through Jesus Christ to provide salvation and grace in eternal life that he wants to live eternity with us seems like we should be the kind of people who are interested in pleasing our heavenly father okay so we're going to hear a little bit about how to do that so if you've got your bible and you want to turn with me we're going to be in romans 13 verses 8 to 14 we're going to read this a couple of different ways as we go through it uh, let's listen to the whole the whole chunk all at once it says let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves, right, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Verse 9, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor 
of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your flesh. So we're going to look at two big ideas that come out of this passage. Okay? The first big idea really talks a lot about how love, how love is the answer to the question of how do you please God. All right? That's the first big thing. And the second thing we're going to talk about talks about how when we are engaged with the love of God, when we understand that love, God's love leads us to want to obey him. Okay, those are the two big things we're going to be talking about this morning out of this passage. So to get back through the first one, because, listen, it's morning for a lot of you and you're doing well, we're going to reread the first two verses so that we have it fresh in our minds so we can talk about it. So let's look at verses 8 to 10 one more time. Okay, so we're concentrating now, right? We're listening. Yeah, here we go. Let no debt remain outstanding except a continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So as I mentioned just a second ago, this is the answer to that question, right? The question that I admitted to wrestling with, that God's been working with me, that question of how do I please God? How do I meet the expectations of the Lord? And the answer is found in that simple, an- the simple word, love, right? Love is the way that we please God. But there's more to it than just saying love is all you need, right? Love is not just all you need. There's, you need to understand what the heck we're talking about. See, because here, what we're being taught is that this concept of love, love of others, and love of God, this is the base instruction, the primary command that is given to all the followers of Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul is not making this up. This is not something that he invented on his own and gave to the church. He is echoing what we hear Jesus Christ teach to his followers. Over in Matthew's gospel, we hear a record of the time that Jesus spoke to his followers and told them that love is the single greatest commandment that has ever been given. Let's listen to what it says in Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus is saying something to his followers, to you and I, to those that are listening, and he's teaching them very simply, what does God expect? He's showing them the expectations, the the bar, the standard that is set before the follower of Christ. And he gives it to us, and he says that this standard that he's giving us, it is the foundation on which everything else is built. It's the foundation for every command, every law, every teaching that's found in the rest of the Bible. But not only is it the the foundation for the law, it is the foundational principle that drives the prophets. You cannot understand any of the words of the prophets of the Old Testament. You can't understand what John the Baptist was about. You can't understand what God is doing through prophecy in the world, through the Spirit, even today, without what? Without love, right? Love the Lord your God with all that you are. Love others as yourself. Now, we take that, and it seems so simple, and you're like, love God, love others. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. Thank you, Justin Graves, all right? That's our old friend. I still see some of those shirts kicking around. It's fantastic. I love it. But the reality is that it's so much bigger than just a simple explanation. What he's saying very clearly is that this is the answer to the biggest question that we should be asking ourselves. 
as people who have received the grace of Jesus Christ, as people who have received the gift of the cross that is freely given to us, what is expected of us now? Right? Grace is a beautiful thing. Our salvation is a free gift, 100%, a gift from Christ. Now how do we respond to that gift? What do we do with our lives? What does God ask of us? The answer is found right there, right? And the Apostle Paul is echoing what we hear Jesus saying in Romans, and he says something that is powerful and profound and worth our time. If we look at verse 8 again, okay, look at Romans 13, 8. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except, right? This is the, the, the thing we should continually do. We should continue to love one another. For whoever loves, right, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. What we're hearing in this statement is that our love of others and our love of the Lord It supersedes any other commandment, any other law, any other expectation that you're going to find in Scripture. It is greater than those. Why is it greater? Why is it the fulfillment of the prophets? Why is it that you must understand this idea of loving others and loving God? Why must that be the centerpiece? That's an important question to ask. How does love solve, fulfill, satisfy the requirement of the law? Well, let me be practical with you about that. All right, let's think about this for a second. I want you to imagine what it would be like here in this church if I got up in front of you and I gave you a law. First off, just the idea of a command seems laughable, right? It wouldn't go very far, but let's just imagine in this world that people would listen to what I have to say. It could happen. I'm not saying it's likely. Let's say I gave a law to the church, right? A command to the church. And I said, you must, thus saith Ryan, you must be welcoming to the people around you in church. You have to be. You must care for the people sitting around you in church on a Sunday morning. It is an imperative. It is unacceptable for anything else And it is a law, the part of our church, that every single person who walks into this church must demonstrate care and compassion for each other while they're at church. How do you think that would work? Some of you might do it for a week, two weeks. Right? I don't think it would go well. Why wouldn't it work? Well, number one, we're rebellious and stubborn people. I am. The only rule I've ever met that I liked is one that I laid down, okay? But the real reason why that idea, that that law wouldn't work is because you know the answer. You know that you you cannot legislate love. You can't demand that you care for other people. No one could get up in front of you and lay down a law that says you have to be compassionate and welcoming to other people. You know that if it's not in your heart, If it's not your idea, if it's not what you want, it won't meet the expectation. It won't meet the standard, will it? It has to come from within you, right? To be welcoming, to be loving, to show compassion to the other people that are part of your church must be something that you want to do. No law is ever going to get you there. No amount of nagging from the preacher is ever going to make it work. Okay, let's think if I gave you a different law. Right? And this is one that's been tried in lots of different religious settings in the past. Let's say I mandate that you must give financially to support the church. And let's say I set up a system to track everyone and to give you regular reports and to send out statements to let you know that you're not giving enough. You laugh nervously. <laughs> right? But we know that this, this sort of thing, is, it's, it happens, right? This is the, the basis of most religious rules. You take something that is a good thing, that's good for you, and you put it into law, and what happens? People rebel. People turn against it. If you try to legislate service to Christ, service through your time, service through your finances, whatever that looks like, if you try to legislate that, all that you do is you create a whole system of people who are trying to do the bare minimum 
to satisfy the expectation. Right? You don't create generosity. You don't create a happy heart. You don't create people that are overjoyed to be a part of what God is doing in his people and on his church. What you do is you create people who do the least so that they can get away with it, so that they can get out. That's sort of what employees are. All right? Show up as late as possible, leave as early as possible, and steal as much as you can. <laughs> yes. That was a principle that was given to me by my first boss. <laughs> Imagine, right? Imagine how well that worked with all of our staff. Like, we were like, well, those are the rules, guys. <laughs> yeah. Mm. The reality is, we know, you cannot command love, can you? It doesn't work. You can't require love. Love has to be something that is built in you, that grows out of you. It has to be something that you desire and you want. And that's exactly what we hear next in the second part of this teaching, that when we love the Lord, when we love others, it will lead us to a place of change and action. We will act on what we know God wants for us. We will act on what God says is right and true, not because he says it's right and true, but because of love. Okay, let's listen to what he says next. Okay, so let's look back at Romans 13, 11 to 14. It says, and do this, right? This, this idea of loving God, loving others, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. See, the, the truth that is being given to us here is telling us that when we are surrounded by the love of God, when we are engaged with the love of God, when we understand the love that he has shown for us and we are walking in that love, our desire grows in us, a desire grows in us to want to be obedient to Christ, to please our Heavenly Father. That's a beautiful thing when it happens. Right? When the motivation goes from being a chore to something that you're honored to do. When you hear the teaching of God and you don't think, ugh, always trying to take the fun out of everything. I was hoping to do a little carousing this afternoon. I had an afternoon of debauchery all lined up, and now. <laughs> right? When you go from feeling like, oh, the, the weight of this, this rule, this law, into a place where you're like, of course not, because I want to honor. I want to do what you want. That's what love does. That's how love changes our heart toward the commands of God. And I love the way this is described. It talks about it in terms of being clothed with Christ. Let's look at it in verse 14, okay? This is the last of those verses. It says, rather, clothe yourselves, okay? Romans 13, 14 says, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Right, what an awesome thing when we think about what this is. This is a physical image to describe a spiritual and personal decision. Right? It's so hard to think about taking the love of God into your life and letting it become something that wraps around you, become something that floods every part of your life. But when we th start thinking about it as put on like, like a jacket, put on like a robe, put on like a towel around you, put on Christ around you, let it envelop you, let it become something that is all around you, it's a little bit easier to understand. It's something that, for me, makes it a little more physical. Let me, I want to illustrate this, this point because I think, it's, I think it's pretty important. I don't know if you know what these are. This is an ancient torture device. <laughs> Let's say that you came to me and unwisely told me that I must wear a tie. I will fight you. 
I don't want to wear a tie ever again. You know, I, I think that men's fashion needs to change. And I'm, I'm going to be the leader. Right? I'm setting the standard. Feel free to follow me. But let's say you come to me and you say, Ryan, you have to wear this tie. I'm going to say no. And if you say, Ryan, I, you have to or else. And you force me to do it where there's a penalty involved. And oh, well, fine. Give me your stupid tie and I'll wear your stupid tie. But I won't do it with love. I won't do it with joy. I won't do it with happiness. In fact, I probably won't even tie it right, and I'm just going to annoy you all the time with this tie. But let's imagine another situation where you love me, and I love you, and you have given me this tie as an act of love, an expression of your love to me, and you want me to wear the tie as a way to see this gift on me. I might not like that, I might find it awkward, uncomfortable. I might struggle with it. But the reality is because I love you, and I know that you love me, and I know that you've given me this tie as an act of love, I'll do it. Right? I'll do it for you. I'll do it because I love you. I'll do it because I want to satisfy you and please you. Not in a bad way, not in a trying to please other people all the time, but but out of love. I I get it, like this is a gift, and you want me to wear the gift. I'll do that for you. The same thing is true with our our walk with Christ. Following Jesus, let's all be honest, following Jesus can be awkward, right? It can be uncomfortable at times, right? There's some things that Jesus asks us to do and to think and the way that he wants us to treat other people, and when we put that into practice at work and at school and at home, it can be bumpy, messy. You can struggle. Why do you do it? Well, if you're doing it because he's commanded it, you're going to hate it, and you're not going to understand it. But if you do it because you know he's given you this rule because he loves you, and because you love the Lord back, you're going to give it a shot. You're going to try it out. You're going to take it on board. You're going to let it become a part of you. When we are clothed with Christ, when we are clothed with his love, and we are aware of his love for us, something changes in us. And we become dissatisfied with our sin. We become to a place where we're just not comfortable rebelling against God regularly. And we're not able to just sit in our sin and to pretend like it's okay in God's eyes. We know that it's not, and we know that what we're doing is hurting ourselves, and it's also disappointing the Lord. And we don't like that. That's not judgment. That's not God being angry. That's love at work. When you love someone, you want to try to please them, to meet the standard, to meet their expectations for you. Does that mean, though, that someone who loves the Lord, a Christian who loves Jesus, does that mean that they will never fall or fail or fall flat on their face or sin and struggle? You know the answer to that. Loving God does not make you perfect. Okay, let me just, I'll just say that again in case you missed it. Loving Jesus Christ, loving the Lord does not make you perfect. And it never will. I love Jesus, and I struggle with temptation and sin. I love the Lord. And the way that I know that my love for him is being received, even in those times of struggle, is that God does not leave me in those times of struggle. I'm not left alone to to, to sort it out for myself and to climb my way back up to the expectations of God. I know that my Heavenly Father is right there with me in the midst of my trials, and He is ready for me to get back up on my feet and start serving Him again. He'll never leave you and never forsake you because He loves you. Love means that we are never, ever, ever comfortable looking at evil and calling it good. Right? We are never going to be comfortable with listening to the definitions of who we are that come from the world that doesn't believe in Christ. There's always going to be a mismatch, a misfit. We're going to see this disconnection, and we're going to struggle if that's what we're trying to do. But I really want you to hear me for a second. Okay? 
If, if you've zoned out, you've been thinking about lunch, I get it, that's cool. I want you to hear me for a second. If you're in a place of struggle, a place of trial, a place of temptation, if you're in a place where you have fallen flat on your face again and again and again, and you're in what you feel is you're at the bottom, you feel crushed, you feel the weight of what you're going through, I want you to hear me. What you need is not more law. You don't need more commands. You don't need more rules. You need more love. You need more of God's love in your life. When you're in this place of addiction and trial and struggle and pain, what you need is to draw near to the Lord and allow his love to fill every part of you. That's what you need. But it raises our last question that we're going to look at today. All right, if it's what you need, if what we need is to experience the love of God, and that's something that we absolutely need in the deepest part of ourselves, the question is, how? How can you grow? How can you mature? How can you be expanding in your appreciation, your knowledge, and your experience of God's love for you? Like, if it's so important, we need to know what it takes to grow in this area. So I want you to, to think about, you can go back and study this in your own time, but I want to read for you the answer. It comes out of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. Pretty much all of 1 John is dealing with this question, but this is a really good snapshot. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because, why? Because God is love. Verse nine, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. There's three words that summarize how we should grow in our love of God, right? Those three words are God is love. Now that sounds so simple. And it sounds too easy to be true. But the reality is that if you want more of God's love in your life, then you need more of God. How do you get more of God? That's not what we're talking about. You're not talking about pouring more of God into your life. We're talking about growing in your relationship with the Lord, walking with him, maturing, expanding, growing in your relationship. If God is love, right, just like the scripture teaches, and if love is what we need to know him and to grow in him and to step away from the things that are hurting us and step into his perfection, into his great gift, into his mercy, if love is what we need, then it makes sense that we should find a way to grow in God, to understand more of it. Let me give you three practical examples of how we can do that. These are gifts given to us by God, right? These three things, these are incredible gifts. We've been given the word of God, we've been given the spirit of God, and the people of God, right? We've been given these three things that we often take for granted. We, we know they're around us all the time, we know that they're constantly present in our lives, but we don't really pay attention to them for what they are. They are the, the path. They are the way that we connect with God on a greater basis. They're the way that we learn more about God, that we experience more about God, and that we practice what we learn. Let me explain, all right? The Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is everywhere, and it is always on, right? God's wisdom, His Word, what God says about Himself and what he teaches you about your, yourself, what he teaches you about us, it's always available to you. If you're in a place of question and doubt and struggle, you don't have to go around asking everybody what you think 
what, what they think that you should be doing. You need to come to the Lord and realize that God has given you his truth, his word, and it is always available to you. His wisdom is always on. Now maybe you don't know where to begin. Maybe that's a place where you don't know how to start reading the Bible. It seems too scary, too strange. Cool. Join one of our life groups. Right? If you're not already in a life group, you can join one. You can go to the info desk today. You can fill out a contact card, drop it in the box. Tell us who you are. Tell us you want to join a life group. We'll get in touch with you. We'll help you get into a small group of people who are seeking to study the Bible together, to pray together, and to grow in their knowledge and wisdom of the Lord. Keep coming to church. That's another thing you can do. All right, make the opportunity to be together with God's people in this moment, make this a priority in your life. And one of the things that you can do is you can grab any of the millions of tools that are available to you in the world. Just on that little uh, app, the church app, Bible app thing, the version thing, if you go in there and look under uh, reading plans, just start looking for plans of how do you read the Bible, and, and look on the search for more, you're gonna find a thousand different collections of, well, what do you wanna know about? Do you wanna know about uh, anxiety? Cool, read these passages. You wanna know about love? Read these passages. You wanna know how to begin reading the Bible? Cool. There's a path for you. There's tools everywhere. There's people all around you who want to encourage you. Let's be real. If you're a part of a church and you come to church like, once a month, twice a month, maybe more than that, the reality is that you are desiring to grow in your knowledge of the Lord. And the people around you want to help you with that. Sometimes you just need to ask. You just need to find a friend, grab somebody else and say, I don't get this. Help me get started. Let's look at the second gift that we've been given, the Spirit of God. Every single one of us who believes in Jesus Christ has been given God's own Spirit. That is the promise of Jesus Christ. It is the true teaching of his word. You cannot be in a relationship with God without the spirit of God in you. And every one of us who believes in Jesus Christ, who is called on his name by faith, has been given the spirit of the living God. Here's the deal. If God is love, guess what? The spirit is love. And when the spirit is at work in your life, so is God's love at work in your life. How do you engage with the Spirit? What does it look like to engage with the Spirit? Well, that's a whole, like, 10-week course. But let me give it to you in about two seconds. Maybe you should read the Bible where it talks about the Holy Spirit. That's a good place to start. And then as you read it, pray about it. Just try those two things. Read about the Holy Spirit, pray about it. You start doing that, you start listening, and start looking for the leadership of the Spirit in your life, and you are going to be surrounded by God's love. You're going to find it so much easier to identify temptation and sin and step away from that when you are engaging with the Spirit, when you're engaging with God's love on a regular basis. All right, the third gift that I want you to know about. All right, I know this is practical stuff. You already think you know everything. I get it. But the third thing is the people of God. Here in 1 John, we just read about this. It says that if you love the Lord, no exception, you will love his people. All right, you cannot say that you are a follower of Christ, and yet hate the church. And when we talk about the church, what are we talking about? The organization? We're talking about our, our ABN number? No, no, no. We're talking about the people. We're talking about the followers of Jesus Christ. When we are filled with God's love, we have in us a love for our family, our family of faith, our brothers and sisters, the people who make up the church. But not only are we filled with love for them, they are a resource for us. The church is a laboratory for how should you learn, what does it look like to love other people? The church is a great laboratory for that. Why do you think there's so many weird people in a church? Have you ever wondered about that? Like most of the other people in the church are really bizarre and you're the only normal one. <laughs> That's so weird. Why is it like that? Well, because this is an opportunity for you to try to show love to weird people. Right? It's a safe environment. It's a lab experience. You can go in and try it. You can come and try to be nice to me and see how that goes. And you can say, oh, that didn't really work out well. I'm going to try this other person over here. Oh, that worked a lot better. All right? That's the reality. Like, we have been given an incredible gift. If you want to know the love of God, you have to act on it. You've got to put it into practice. This is a great place for us to learn. I'll sum this all up. Right? You ready? Let's be finished. 
I'm going to sum all of this up by saying to you that if you have no desire to grow, you won't grow. If you are unwilling to engage in the Spirit of God, you will always be thirsty for the Spirit of God. If you are not willing to be a part of the family of faith, to tie into others, to allow them to love you while you love them, you will always feel isolated and alone. The missing ingredient is you. The missing ingredient is are you willing? Do you want to experience the love of God on a daily basis? Do you want God's love to mold you and change you into the kind of person who is living day after day wrapped in Christ? Because if you do and you are willing, God's made it very easy for you to find the answers. They're everywhere. Encouragement is everywhere. Support is everywhere. You are not alone. But if you are feeling alone, if you are feeling isolated, let me challenge your willingness. Are you truly willing to engage with these three gifts? Are you willing to open the word of God to hear what God has to say to you? Are you willing to invite the Spirit to be a part of your every morning and every evening? Are you willing to have the church, the people of God, be a part of your family? When you are, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guarantee you, you're gonna, you're gonna find it awkward. There's gonna be some uncomfortable stuff. It's gonna be a bit like wearing a tie at times. You're gonna be like, I don't know about this. But hang in there, persist, endure. And as you do, you're gonna find your life is overflowing with God's love. One of the things we do to experience God's love weekly is we take communion. We're gonna do that in just a moment. But when we do this today, I want to I want to challenge you to feel that bread, look at that cup, think about what you're doing, and to engage in the love of God. See that what you hold in your hand is an example of God's love for you. Let me pray for you, then we'll get after it. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the way that your word challenges us, pushes us out of our comfort zone and into places we need to be. Lord, we need to hear your challenge. We need to know that you are calling us to walk with you, to grow with you. Lord, that you don't want us to just stay where we are, even though you love us for who we are. You don't want us to just stay where we are. We want us to get up with you and grow and mature and become strong and to become like Jesus Christ more today than we did yesterday. Why do you want that for us, Lord? Because you love us. You love us so much that you will lead us. And Lord, we thank you for that gift. Lord, as we get into this, this opportunity this morning with communion, this act of worship, we just pray, Lord, that we would experience your love this morning, that we would physically, tangibly understand how much you love us because of what you've done through Jesus Christ. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.